The final passage of Scripture and the one that we're going to focus on for the sermon today is from James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of God as it's recorded there. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen that the Lord, what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for it. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of your holy word, and we ask that you would open it up to us and teach us from it this morning. May it be your voice that we hear, and may it be you that we follow. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, guess what? We are almost through the book of James. This week and then next week, and you will have persevered through the entire book of James, start to finish, looking at each passage in turn. So give yourselves a round of applause. Good job. Good job. It is a momentous thing. It really is. To study the full counsel of God, to look at an entire passage or an entire letter or an entire book of the Bible, that is an important thing, and I'm glad that you're willing to do it with me. Now, the series through James is subtitled. You might know the title. It's called The Book of James. That's the title. Duh, that was really creative of me, by the way. The Book of James. But it's subtitled, God in Every Area of Life. Because James, if you've been noticing, has covered a ton of ground. He's, he's been all over the place, looking at all kinds of things and seeing how our relationship with God must affect the way that we live. So let me just give you a taste of where we've been. James has talked talk to us about how to suffer. How as Christians do we suffer? How to listen. You know, we need to be good listeners. We need to be a people who are quiet and listen to others, really intending to hear what they have to say. How to speak? How do we respond then as believers? How to treat others? I could go on and on and on. God in every area of life. Today we will consider two more areas of life that our faith in Jesus Christ affects. Our prosperity and our patience our prosperity, what we have, our wealth, the things we own. How does God meddle in those areas of life? He does. He says, I'm Lord over that area of your life. And also patience. 
And anybody who lives for any length of time in this fallen world knows how important it is and how hard it is to be patient sometimes. Uh, James would have us answer two questions. So this is the way we're going to go through uh, this passage of Scripture. We're going to answer two questions. And the first question is this. What's wealth for? So prosperity, right? What's wealth for? What's, what's the purpose of having things? What's the purpose of having money? What's wealth for? And the second question is why is patience important? Why does God call us to be a patient people? What's the importance of that? in our lives, and especially in our lives as we follow Jesus Christ. So let's look at each of these in turn, and I think God has a lot to teach us today from this passage. So what's wealth for? Verse 1 to verse 6 is where I see James kind of asking this question, right, and answering this question. So verses 1 to 6 of today's passage. Now, it's interesting because the first thing he does is not look at wealth as what it's for, right? He actually... He he shows us three things that wealth is certainly not for. He condemns three areas that we often get confused with thinking wealth is all about these things. And he says, no, 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 no. Let's let's shut those down real quick. So we're going to look at three things that wealth certainly is not for. First, to begin, our resources aren't for hoarding. Our resources are not uh, for amassing and hoarding. Now, uh, Natalie and I have a good friend who just recently, we met her in Pennsylvania, but she just recently became a lead organizer, and that is a title, a lead organizer on the A&E series Hoarders. How many of you have watched an episode of Hoarders? Yeah, (laughs) it's like watching a train wreck, isn't it? And you can't look away. I had not watched an episode of Hoarders. But when our friend became a lead organizer on this show, I was like, well, I'm going to watch an episode of Hoarders just so I can see Carolina. She's a wonderful Christian woman, and she's really organized, like super organized. So polar opposite from me, okay? But, but I wanted to see her on this show, and, and the show's been going on for 13 seasons. Why? Because, again, we can't look away. All of this dysfunction, people being possessed by their possessions, right? And we can easily sit back and go, you know what? That's terrible. Hoarding those things, it's terrible. But what James says here is when we look at these people who are in these desperate situations, we think that. We should also think the same thing about the, the very rich people who who accumulate mass riches and this keep it all for themselves. He says that should be equally disturbing to us. That's just as dysfunctional as the stuff we see on hoarders. It's not what wealth is for. I have a a relatively wealthy relative who has probably made millions and millions of dollars during the course of his career. And yet, he's not known for being generous with that money. Uh, Not with his employees. Not with his friends. Not even with his family is he generous with this money. In fact, he, he will pinch every penny. So if you think about Scrooge, right? This is how he behaves with the mass of money that he has collected. He's hoarding it. James says this is not how it should be. Verse 2 and verse 3, your wealth, he warns to people who do this, has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. One thing we know for sure is that wealth is not for hoarding and not for storing up in banks. There's something else that God intends for us to do with our wealth. Next, next, James warns that our resources aren't for living lavishly. They aren't for luxurious living, right? We're not supposed to just go out immediately whenever we get a check and, or whenever we have a, a, an influx of a lot of cash and just go, hey, what can I do for myself through all of this money? How can I use it? Right, going out and buying the, the fanciest new technological gadgets or 
really, really nice cars or beautiful houses or, or really nice objects to go in those houses. No, James says it's not for lavish living. That's not what wealth is for. Oprah has eight mansions around the world. Bill Gates only has four. Way to go, Bill, right? Showing some restraint, only four. What do you do with that many houses? Most of the time, those houses sit empty, don't they? Unused. Just property. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's an element of hoarding in that, isn't there? I've got all of this property. What am I using it for? Luxurious living. James says no. I mean, we think, oh, well, it's theirs. Uh, Oprah earned her money. Bill Gates earned his money. It must be for them. James says, no, it's not for them. It's not really yours. Rather, James says, everything that you've been given is God's. You are simply stewards of what God owns. And guess what? James isn't the only one who says that. Jesus says precisely the same thing. He has the precise same warning in Matthew chapter 25. He tells a story about some servants who were given stuff by the master, and the master goes away, and he says when that master returns, he's going to demand an accounting for how those servants have used the wealth he gave them. And the same, friends, is true of us. It's not for luxurious living for our own benefit. It's for the Lord. It's for his kingdom. When the master comes back, how will you answer the question? How have you used what you've been given? We all have to grapple with that. Finally, James warns, our resources aren't for abusing others. It isn't for injustice. Now, we know that this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. But this really, really angers God. And perhaps maybe nothing angers God more than when we use what he has given us to work injustice into the world because it is the opposite of God's character. He is the good God who blesses people with what he has made. He is a generous God who cares for people, and he is the God of justice. And so when we take what he has given us and we use our power and leverage that power against others to take advantage of them, it really angers God. Verse 4, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. These are the warnings God gives the rich who are abusing their wealth that they have been given by God to work injustice in the world. And we know that these kinds of injustices happen all the time, don't we? I mean, we know they happen because it's become a cliche to some extent in our society that the rich have a different standard to live by than the poor do. We know when we see an article about some senator's son or daughter who was in a car crash and there was alcohol involved and somebody in the other car was badly injured. We know it's going to be hard to get a conviction there maybe because they're going to have the best lawyers. They're going to find a way. We think justice needs to be done, but really only injustice happens in the end as the legal proceedings go on and on and on. And no one's ever convicted. No one ever pays for the damage done. We hear about a rich Hollywood producer taking advantage over decades, actresses who come to him just wanting to work, wanting to do what they're called to do, but instead he takes advantage of that. And there's nothing that they can do, these these actresses. Nothing. I mean, it's a cliche. People using the wealth they've been given for unjust purposes. This is the way of our fallen world. The wealthy have power. They can get away with lots and lots when dealing with those who do not have power. And yet James says, this will not always be so. He says that God is watching. 
He encourages us and warns us that God will call those who use their money and status in abusive ways. He's going to call them to account for how they use what they've been given. They'll have to answer for what they've done. They'll have to pay. The victim's cries have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And that's good news. It's good news for for those of us who want justice in the world. The guilty will finally pay. Not one treacherous act will escape justice in one way or another. Either in repentance at the cross of Jesus Christ, there will be justice done, and that person will receive grace. Or they will pay because they have decided to turn away from the living God and work in justices anyway. Now for just a moment, I want to I have a discursus. I'm just going to take like a time out. This discursus is just like a time out. We're going to talk about something else for a second. Because oftentimes this very doctrine that we're talking about right now has been criticized by non-Christians. Uh, Karl Marx referred to it as the opiate of the masses, this idea of final justice in God, to wait on the Lord, right? To wait for the justice to be done. It's just, it's, it's the drug that keeps us from really acting against what is unjust in the world, and that was his criticism. Yet I think his criticism is very short-sighted. It's a really short-sighted view or theory of what Christians really believe and how it really works if we're pursuing God and living in this world. I actually believe that when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and when you pay attention to the Bible, rather than going, you know, one day everything's going to be right, so I just got to sit here now and be patient, you'll work hard for justice. In fact, you're commanded to work hard for the will of God, aren't you? I mean, think about the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're we're commanded to pray that way, right? To work for justice now. This isn't something that makes us lazy. It's something that makes us active. It also, belief in Jesus also frees us from this idea that this world is all we have. It tells us there is a far better world and you were created for that world, not this world, not this fallen sinful world. It's not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Get all the fun you can right now, right? It, just sidestep any injustice and just go for joy and happiness and lavished living. No, that's not what the gospel tells us. It says, no, another world, God's kingdom world is invading this world and you you get to be a part of that. So even when we see injustices out there, we can work against those, even though the odds seem really small that we're going to do anything, right? That we're going to accomplish anything. No, we know that in the end, we're on the winning side and we can work against those injustices now. That's the calling of the Christian. And this is one last thing, okay? I'm, I promise I'm going to get out of this little discursus and we're going to do time in and the game will be on again. We'll be back at what is well for, but... This is really important. And oftentimes, especially in the secular world, outside of the walls of this church, outside in the community, people don't get this. What is justice without God? If there is no God, what is justice? Define it for me. All justice is, if God does not exist, is a power play so that somebody or another can work whatever they think justice is. Or we can have a popular vote, and it will change over and over again. I mean, just think about the last 30 years in our country, what's right and wrong, how much has changed about what we think is right and what we think is wrong. Without an ultimate being, a personal God, who has revealed what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, we have no sense of what is good and what is bad. Not an ultimate sense, not a stable sense. There is no justice without God. Not ultimate justice, just a changeable justice, a transient justice, something that at one point in time in history seems right and good and we do it, and then at another time we do another kind of thing. Maybe the exact opposite. That's how things happen in a human-run world. 
without God. And that's a real problem for anybody who wants justice without God. We need, we need a God who tells us exactly what is right and what is wrong, what is just and what is not. Super important. All right, time in. Let's get back on the court. We're going to play some more here. Let's get back to wealth. What is wealth for? What is it for? It's for the Lord. It is for God. It is not for any of the things we've looked at. Hoarding, it's not for luxurious living, it's not for uh, controlling others and abusing others and working injustices. No, it is for God and it is for His glory and everything that we have, no matter if we're poor or rich. And quite frankly, in our country, most of us, compared to the rest of the world, we're very rich. What we have, everything we have, including ourselves, is for the Lord. Our very lives are for God and His glory and His honor and His justice. And we are called to be a people who use those things to serve God each and every day. This is how you worship God with money, possessions, and your time, and and all of your energy. You use it for God. That is the Christian purpose. And the way we know how to use it is by digging into our Bibles and finding out what pleases the Lord. Well, let's briefly answer the second question because I I waxed poetic, I guess you could say. Maybe not that poetic. When I go back and watch the sermon, I'll realize how unpoetic it was. But anyway, let's just get briefly to this second question. What is patience? Why is it important? Verse 7 to verse 12. Why is patience important? I want you to think first with me, okay? You got to actually do some work here. Think about a time when you were in a bind, a pinch, a lot of pressure on you, things weren't going your way, you felt like you were under the pile, maybe you felt like somebody was particularly uh, putting you in their sights and trying to make you upset. Remember the question I asked those kids? Someone's picking on you, someone's pressuring you, and it can be an adult version of that, can't it? Think about that time. Now, if if you have a time in mind, and I hope you do, we all go through these times, what was your initial reaction or inclination? What were you inclined to do? What, What are you tempted initially in those moments to pursue, to do? Were you tempted to act hastily? If someone's treating you poorly, are you you tempted to turn the other cheek? Is that the first? Ah, Okay, I'm just going to turn the other cheek. That's just natural for me. Or are you tempted to attack? Or perhaps you're tempted to run away. That's not turning the other cheek, by the way. That's cowardice. That's not patience. That's seeking preservation. We're not talking about that. What was your inclination when you were in a pinch? I imagine if we're being honest, most of us would say, well, when I'm in a pinch, my initial reaction is to to get at the other person and to use whatever means they're using against me I'll use against them if I have that ability that's what I do right they say bad words about me I say bad words about them they cut me off in traffic I zip around them I cut them off in traffic again this is the natural tendency that we all have isn't it and guess what it's not patient in the least we're tempted to lie when we're caught in a pinch. We were tempted to lash out when someone wrongs us. We were tempted to use our power, the things we have, our influence, selfishly to solve our problems rather than to go through the proper channels, the God-ordained channels. Friends, we are tempted to live our lives just like the world around us, just like anybody outside the walls of this church. The ancient church that James was writing to was being persecuted and attacked by those who had power. The ancient church that James is writing to did not have power, didn't have the ability really to defend themselves. But I'm sure the temptation they had was, well, I should just walk away from the faith. Or if I do have some power, I should use that power to get back at those who are attacking me right now. And to that, James says, no, brothers and sisters, do not act that way. Be patient. Wait upon the Lord. 
when I've been wrong by somebody, I reveal sometimes too much about me. But if I've been wrong by somebody, I'm tempted oftentimes to daydream and to imagine what it would be like to have superpowers. You know, like to be invisible. You know, just turn myself invisible and just like walk up to them and pour hot coffee on them or something, you know, just whatever it is. Like I just, these sinful thoughts come into my mind. If I just had superpowers, they would get what they deserve, right? Then justice would be done. But would it? Would justice really be done if I had superpowers and if somebody wronged me, I could get them back? Or would I just be heaping injustice upon injustice? You know, just making the problem more sinful, not less sinful. This is what we do as human beings. We think we see correctly, but we don't see correctly. Not usually. We see selfishly. We are called to be a patient people and to wait on real justice and and even to try to work for real justice. That's why I think Jesus says, turn the other cheek when you're wrong. And then he tells us, but when you see somebody else wrong, you go and you work for justice. Why? Because the person who is not being abused is the best person to work for justice. They're not likely to go overboard and to heap injustice upon justice. Do you see how that works? No, James says, be patient, brothers and sisters. Yet is that all there is to it? Patience for patience' sake? Just go out and be patient. No, not at all. Because there is power in patience. And there is a great witness in patience. When you wait upon the Lord, when you don't lash out, it is perhaps the most powerful testimony you could possibly have in all the world. Because it's otherworldly. It's not acting like the world around us. It's not behaving like the world around us. And people immediately wonder, why aren't they lashing out? Why aren't they trying to get all they can get? Why aren't they using their power, their influence, to get back at that person? Why would they act like that? And suddenly, they recognize something about us that is different. And that difference is so It's the difference between faith in Jesus Christ and ultimate justice in Jesus Christ and not having a faith in Jesus Christ at all, not having confidence that ultimate justice will be done at all. And when people see that in us, when they're affected by that patience in us, it is transforming. In fact, it is the very thing that would lead the believer to become a believer. It's the very way that God has acted with us in patience and kindness which is meant to lead us to repentance, the Bible tells us. God's patience with us, God's kindness with us, His generosity with us is the very thing that transformed our hearts when we believed in Jesus Christ. And so what does James say? He says, act the same way with others and see what God will do with it. See how God will transform lives and hearts so that your very enemies might become your brothers and your sisters in Christ. You won't have an enemy anymore. You have family. And that'll be to the glory of God. Amen. That's our calling. Prosperity and patience. There's a lot in this beautiful letter that James has written. Use your wealth. Use your possessions. Use your time. Use your lives to serve God. And when you're attacked, when you find yourself in a pinch, have patience and wait on the Lord because he will see that justice is done either at the cross when people repent or he'll take care of it on the last day. Amen. Will you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious revelation that you've given us uh, through the Apostle James as you've inspired him by the Holy Spirit to record these things for us, ancient truths which are just as important for us to hear today, just as real and practical as they ever were. And we do ask that we would be a people that see all that we have as yours and uh, a people that use those things to serve you and also 
are a patient people, even when, and especially when we're in the midst of persecution, trials and trouble, when someone's lean on us, that we will be a people who pray for them and are patient and wait upon you to act. And ultimately, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use those activities, that patience in us to transform lives. Here in this congregation, each and every day, outside the walls of this church, throughout Jefferson City and the world, in the church universal, will you bring people to yourself, make them our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.